clients. Other people collect stamps. I collect racing memorabilia. All I wanted to do was collect every race car that I could or any little piece of memorabilia relating to Arkham. We would have approximately 250 items relating directly to Arkham. Now, they're mainly race cards and fan mail. Now, this is the saddle that Pat Half used on Arkham. And to me, it was the ultimate piece of racing memorabilia. I bought it for 11,000 sterling, which I thought was, you know, it, it didn't matter what price it was going to be, I was going to buy it. And we just go around here, we have this particular race card. Now, in my opinion, this is Arkell's greatest race, the Gallagher Gold Cup of 1965. Over on the right is Arkell, who's just eased his way into the picture. This was a handicap, and Arkell carried 16 pounds more than Millhouse. And the word was that Millhouse was coming back to his best. There was a big anticipation about whether the difference of 16 pounds in weight would mean that Arkell would be beaten by Millhouse this time. And if you worry, wonder about this, you can go the way out of sugar from your kitchen cupboard, 16 pounds. It's even, it's quite a lot of, quite a lot of weight difference to carry over three miles. The Gallagher Gold Cup I'm going to be the best performance I thought he ever put up. Millhouse had already won twice that season. He was having his first run. Turning into the straight, I think Mill Millhouse went about six lengths up and everybody said, this is over. And the next thing like that has changed. Millhouse was ridden by David Nicholson. And as Nicholson used to tell it, he thought he got Arkell beat this time. And then he heard this thump, 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 thump. Arkle coming past him absolutely effortlessly and just shot away. He bet him, I think it was 32 lengths, and he set a track record at Sandown today, and that record still stands today. When he won the Gallagher Gold Cup and gave Mill has 16 pounds and broke the track record by 17 seconds, to think that a horse could break a track record by that much and carry the weight that he did, uh, that, that, that was potentially the best performance of his career. Having beaten all comers with ease, Arkell was the undisputed king and no one wanted to challenge him. There were some good horses around, but they looked for alternatives because there was no point. You know, you were just going to follow Arkell around. The irony was that the only horse that really was anywhere near him was virtually the next door box, Flying Bolt. The stable mates were the best of their generation, but they'd never meet in a competitive race because they shared a trainer. The only horse that would have taken him on was in the stable next door to him, Flying Bolt. For just a, a period of time in Flying Bolt's life, that he was definitely his equal. If not, maybe a shade better than him, but that's splitting hairs now. He definitely was his equal for about 18 months. Now, I don't know if he eyeballed Arkell eye to eye in a gold cup, whether he'd have beat him or not, but I definitely think he'd have warmed his tail end around two and a half miles anyway. Then comes Salbina coming up towards the final fence now, and it's Flying Bolt going away. We had another very good horse called uh, Flying Bolt. And uh, he was quite a character, wasn't he? Oh, he was. <laughs> <laughs> Well, can uh, he, he wasn't very pleasant, Annie, but in that go into the stable, you know, art was quite different. Flying Bolt was a of vicious type of horse, you know. Like, no matter how confident you were about him, you couldn't just relax with him because he'd kick you, bite you, he'd do anything with you. He'd con you in the stable, even, like. And I hated riding him because every cow dung and thing, you'd be ducking and diving, you'd be hanging off him the whole time where you could go asleep around there on Arkell. Flying Bolt had been very naughty before he was castrated. He got out of where he ought to have been in a paddock and he covered a she ass. And I believe the mule, <coughs> mule or ginnet, whichever you call it, can beat everything going to the creamery in paddocks well. Arkell at school with Flying Bolt one morning, the two of them, and that's the only time they ever went together. I was riding him and Pat, and we couldn't pull them up like they were taking one another on. You know, we went a hell of a speed up over the four fences, that's all I know, you know. It, it was a good, we're lucky we didn't hit one of them, or I don't know where we'd have finished, you know, but he never let them go again. We did work them together all right, but never jumped together, never. That contest on the Draper Gallops would be the only time the two highest rated chasers ever would go head to head. Who would have prevailed in a competitive race 
remains one of the most tantalising unanswered questions in racing. According to time form, Arto was 212, Flying Bolt was 210. And then the, actually the next best is Sprint Soccer, 192, and Katastar, 191. Yeah. Like, is that, that gap, is, the, is it realistic that there should be such a wide gap between Flying Bolt and the next best? No, I wouldn't think so. I think that's someone's opinion, it's Time Farm's opinion, to put to elevate him to that position. No doubt Arkle and Flying Bolt were two great horses, but the horses that have come on behind have been great horses as well. Sprint Soccer, Kato Star, Denman, Kicking King, all them horses. We're talking about the greatest horse yeah. of all time, and yet, Next door to him, there was a horse who's possibly the second greatest and, horse like, of all time, and arguably, at like, times, he, he equaled his performance. Yeah, a bit like Nichols with Cato and Denman yeah. at the same time, you know what I mean? But Cato, Cato Star and Denman, they're not the two best horses in living memory. No, whereas, you these know, are. But, but are, you know what I mean? Like, it's a huge coincidence, isn't yeah, it? That they're yeah. around the same mm. year at the yeah. same time, living yeah. next door to each other, yeah. and they're like 20 pounds in, superior to every, the best horse that's yeah. won since. And the never never since. Since. Just with, with Cato Star, I think, for me, he's been the best horse since, since that time. Yeah. Uh, and I think he gets it because he was so dominant in and, his and time. And on different tracks as well. Different Kenton, tracks, Sandown, different grounds. Cheltenham. He had all sort of the attributes of a of a really high class horse. Yeah, yeah. He had pace. Yeah. He could travel. He could stay. I'd say if there was any horse that would have worried Arkham. Now I still think he would have wanted seven or ten pound off him. Yeah, wouldn't but, but not 21. No. Ah, oh, no. No, no. No, yeah. not 21. That, that's, that's a, like, that, that's I, the greatest I, I'm with you. Like, yeah. Cato Star, for me, yeah. it, like what you said as well, no, like, mm. the, the versatility that he displayed. Yes. It, it two Tingle Creeks, five King Georges, yeah. and two Gold Cups. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and to finish second in another Gold Cup. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal range of abilities. That he it's able it's to going show. to be very boring. I mean, we're talking from Arkell's time to now, yeah. and yet the three of us are saying the same thing. Yeah. But I think Cato Star did epitomise all the attributes that Arkell had. Yeah. But... To me, not to the same level. Everyone's going to have their opinions, and you're never going to know the answer. And the Arco camp will always stay in the Arco camp, and the Cordo Star camp will always be in there. But I think it's a hypothetical question because it never happened. But I, I guess there probably was nothing between them. It would have been really interesting. They're really interesting. It's like comparing football teams of different eras, you know. How the hell would you ever know? But you, people have got opinions, and that's what makes it so good. And you, you know, as I said, it's all about opinions, and I've got mine, and everyone else got their sort of, and that's just how it is. But there couldn't have been a lot between Corto and Arco. Corto star won two Cheltenham Gold Cups. As 1966 dawned, a rampant Arco was on the brink of claiming his third. <laughs> Unbeatable, and the Gold Cup hat trick looked a sure thing. The only horse that could beat Arco was Arco himself. Arkel had won his two gold cups and he went back to complete the hat-trick as a 10 to 1 on shot. When you think about 10 to 1 on, so you have to have 10 euro on to win 1 euro or 100 euro to win 10 euro if you, if you want to back him, if you want to get, get Arkel on side, which it's an incredibly short price for a gold cup, which is the blue ribbon of National Hunt Race. In theory, all the best horses, all the best staying chasers are running in this race and Arkel's a 10 to 1 on shot to win it. Once he got the better mill house, the rest of his Gold Cups turned out to be kind of anti-climax. Uh, they were winding down races for him, basically, at the end of each season. That's right. They, they would be the two of his easiest races. He's running against Hurst at level weight, so he's, at this stage, he'd probably five stones superior to some of them. So, like, it was a, kind of a, a little holiday spin for him, really. It's fundamentally an exhibition match. Uh, and the only thing is, because Arkham was very impetuous, slight danger that he might uh, make a mistake or something. But that was really all you were thinking is could he fall, because basically you knew he was miles better than the other. Not a complete circuit. Oh, and he barely took off. He just didn't take off. Parted the birch like the Red Sea. When you watch it again, it all happened so quickly. Pat Tuff instinctively shot his lower legs forward, lengthened the reins, to keep the balance, to keep him in the saddle. A lot of jockeys would have fallen off, even though Arkel didn't fall himself. Why did he do it? Who knows? Maybe he had a look at the crowds, or maybe he saw the stands, or maybe he heard the noise, but he just he just didn't seem to jump the fence. He seemed he didn't seem to see it. And just left a hole in the fence. Didn't stop him, oh, went on and won the race. Any other horse. Would have been on the floor. He just looked at it and ignored it. And how he got the other side, well, you should have heard the gasp from the crowd here. It looked as though he wasn't going to jump at all. The partnership stayed together. He found a leg, as they say, in racing. But it was a heart-stopping moment now. 
Pat Taff had saved Arkel, or perhaps Arkel had saved Pat Taff. Either way, that legendary empathy between horse and rider had snatched another memorable victory from the jaws of defeat. Wonderful jockey, wonderful horseman. I think he complimented the horse enormously. I don't think Pat himself would say he was going to be the sort of stylist of all times, but he was wonderful on this horse. He obviously knew him backwards. Pat Taff had his unique way of riding. He was a horseman as much as anyone. But he just got on brilliantly with that horse, knew him, and they just trusted each other, and they knew each other inside out, and th th that relationship is very important between horse and jockey. Well, he's got great confidence in him, and, like, he gets me out of any trouble that I get into in a race, and he can accelerate at the finish, just the same as if you were driving a Rolls Royce, and you put your foot in the accelerator, he leaves the rest. When people differentiate between a horseman and a jockey, what they mean is that a jockey is skilled and stylish and rides a finish, you know, it's neat and tidy. Um, horsemanship skills, though, arguably way more important in that you can, you know, you're in tune with the horse, you understand the horse, you can get a horse settled, get him jumping, see your stride, get inside his mind and know what's going to help him or what's going to make him tick, and Pat Taff was brilliant at that. I remember Paddy Pendergast used to say, Ah, oh, sure, he's a, no, he's a terrible rider. They ought to get a, put a jock on him. They ought to put a jockey on that horse. You know? <laughs> he was a lovely horseman and a charming man. Pat Taff and Arkle now set their eyes on a second hat trick with a third win in the 1966 Hennessy. But it wasn't to be. Giving away 35 pounds in weight, his extraordinary two-year winning streak was ended by Stallbridge Colonist. So he was beaten narrowly by Stallbridge Colonist. He then went to Ascot, where they had recently started jump racing, and he won a valuable race there. He then went to Kempton Park for the 1966 King George, for which he was an absolute certainty. Well, I was actually there. It was the first time I went with my mother. My dad stayed at home. I went with my mother to Kempton. He was going along fine, and then from about two-thirds away, all of a sudden, things didn't seem that great. He uh, looked as if everything was going perfectly all right until the very far end of the Kempton race course. And then he just wasn't coming away from dormant, as you'd expect. He led over the last fence, but he was clearly in, in trouble, and he uh, faltered badly and was caught just before the line by a horse called Dormant. Dormant was just a journeyman horse. The idea that Dormant could beat Arkle was, you know, it's absolutely not possible. The unthinkable had happened. How could Arkle, the horse of the century, have lost to a lesser being like Dormant? For a moment, people thought, because Stalbridge had beaten him in the Hennessy, and that maybe he was starting to wane or something, that he was becoming vulnerable. It was discovered thereafter that Arkle had probably uh, run um, a good part of the race with a, with a broken foot, which shows something about the courage of the horse. We walked the course yeah. and, uh, and the, the ditch they had a, a sort of a, a clay thing and was a mark. Whether it was his or not, we thought it was. Yeah, remember, his there. foot went in under the top rail of the ditch and we believed that that's where he got his foot going up. I think it was until Maxi Cosby flew over and read the x-rays and all that type of stuff i was still thinking that he was going to run the gold cup like that's how naive i would have been about an injury like that he was x-rayed and it showed that he had fractured a petal bone which is a bone right inside the hoof so there was that uh, there was devastation it's a very serious injury it's a fracture involving a very vital bone is there any likelihood now that uh Arco might race again this season oh no no i, I think so, i think that's out well he's not in any pain which is great relief and I was afraid he would be, but he's not, and Mr. Cosgrove was quite satisfied about that. Arkell's injury wasn't mere racing news, it was a national disaster. Uh, they say there are a lot of things you remember in life. We're all meant to remember when Kennedy was assassinated. But I can remember that night when Arkell was injured, and there was a bulletin on the radio, and Racing probably didn't in those days get a lot of mentions. The only horse that was going to get racing onto the radio was Arkham. The horse's distress prompted a groundswell of sympathy from his followers. Looking back now, the outpouring of, of public concern for Arkham, it was a manifestation of 
his popularity as a racehorse and the, the, the affection with which general public viewed him. And we had one gorgeous envelope that arrived, Arkell Island near London, which I thought was rather fun. <laughs> it had come from Hamburg, I think. <clears throat> I got, um, I've got a secretary now that deals with his fan mail because uh, I got quite out of hand. I couldn't keep pace at all. I remember being utterly bereft and thinking that it was almost like a death in the family and I had to be talked round and reassured that he'd be all right. I, I, I still um, remember the tears, yeah. 18 months of recovery later, Arkell's comeback was penciled in for Fairy House in April 1968. His adoring public were ready for an emotional reunion. Arkell to the Irish public is something very special. And the crowd gathered at Fairy House to pay homage to a horse that has given such great honor to the country and indeed such great pleasure to so many people. We all wanted to be there to see him, this comeback. It would have been some, it would have been some hooly to just see him come back there. They were going to farm a race out for him at Fairy House and then Pat came down one morning here and we've done a good bit of work, we tried to do a good bit of work with him and he wasn't right, he wasn't certainly striding out the way he was and Pat, when he pulled up, he said, no, no, we're not going any further, he's not himself and that's it. So the boss man said, that's it, you know, he's not racing anymore. I don't think the comeback was ever believable, credible or on. The world moves on. When he went back into training, Pat Taff and Tom Draper rather thought that he'd lost some of his old zip and fire. You decided that, uh, well, there would be no more Arkell on the race course? Yes. Uh, yeah, very reluctantly, but I think it was right. The retirement years passed quickly. Arthritis soon robbed Arkell of his speed and strength, and by 1970, he struggled to stand up. The decision was made to put him to sleep. It's always sad looking back on what might have been, but when you look now at the performance of horses, 12, 13 even, it beggars belief what he could have done. If he stayed sound, he might have equal Golden Miller, who won five Gold Cups. There was no reason why he wouldn't have won two more. And he might have surpassed him and won six Gold Cups, because the horses that come on behind him, definitely, for the next three years, none of them would have beat him. He stopped when he was still at his peak, and therefore people always remember him, you know, as this great wonder that strode the race course quite briefly. Arkell raced continually over a number of seasons, met practically every challenge that was set to him and set a standard that has not been equaled. He was the horse of the time and of all time. That no other horse has ever captured the imagination of the world. Arkell wasn't merely one of the great racing experiences of my